Good evening, this is Damon Fordham for History 111 for Charleston Southern University. This is the lecture for May the 21st, 2020, in the midst of this coronavirus situation. And we're going to speak today regarding the last, finish up ancient Egypt, the first part of ancient Egypt, and get into a little bit about the Indus Valley and conclude by talking about ancient China. And this lecture contains a couple of my uh, favorite subjects to discuss, which will kind of show in my enthusiasm on the subject, okay? Now, in the last class we spoke about ancient Egypt as well as uh, some of the great pharaohs of ancient Egypt, including Ramesses II and Tutmos III and Amenhotpes IV. Your test, incidentally, will be held on May the 26th, it's coming Tuesday. The 25th, Monday, is a holiday for Memorial Day, so you don't have to worry about that. But I'm also including the study guide for that test in the announcements, as well as your guide sheet for your final paper, which is going to be due on June the 18th. Okay? So, now that we're clear on that, let's begin. Now, after I told you all, all about the, uh, these great pharaohs of ancient Egypt, I'm going to speak on, and I mentioned in passing in the last class that for many years the great writings of ancient Egypt were lost for 1,300 years. how that happen? Well, this is slightly getting ahead of the story, but I think it's very important. You see, in ancient Rome, see, after Egypt fell and Greece fell, we're going to talk a little bit later in the semester about ancient Rome. And one of the last emperors of the ancient Roman Empire was a man by the name of Theodosius I. Theodosius I was the king that, out, that outlawed all religions in ancient Rome except for Christianity. And as such, Egypt in those days was under the Roman Empire. So he banned all of the hieroglyphic writings of ancient Egypt. Because, as you'll remember, I spoke of how uh, hieroglyphics were primarily the formal and the religious writings of ancient Egypt. So he outlawed all of that because he felt that hieroglyphics were an unchristian, pagan written language. So, since he, ba he banned this about 391, 392 AD, depending on your source. But, as a result of that, the knowledge of hieroglyphics died out because the language of ancient Rome was Latin, as well as they used some, some of the educated people used some Greek, right? So for 1,300 years, the great writings of each ancient Egypt were lost to humanity, and Egypt became a blank slate to mankind with the exception of what was uh, written about it in the Bible. So. In 1799, Napoleon, the French emperor, had uh, occupied Egypt. And during the occupation, there was a, uh, an officer from ancient Egypt at this time by the name of Pierre-Francois Bouchard. And one of Pierre-Francois Bouchard's soldiers happened to find this interesting stone. And the stone had all this strange writing on it. Well, they took it back to France, and there was a French linguist by the name of Jean Champion. And Jean Champion was knowledgeable of two of the languages that were on that stone. They were demotic, which was, we talk about a uh, little, not demonic, demotic, which was the uh, informal written language of the Egyptian people that had survived, and ancient Greek. But lo and behold, there was also another strange language on there. It was the hieroglyphics. So as Jean Champion studied the, studied the, uh, the demotic and the ancient Greek, which he could read, by the way, he said, hey, wait a minute. These two are saying the same thing. And so he decided to match letter by letter of the hieroglyphics with what he knew of the ancient Greek and what the demotic said, and that cracked the code. And incidentally, I should also add that the, uh, the French soldier, the French soldiers under Pierre-Francois Bouchard, 
they found the stone in Egypt in a place called Rosetta. Ladies and gentlemen, that is how the Rosetta Stone came into being, and that is how we know today of the great writings of the ancient Greek, the ancient Egyptians. But there was another case that we were we weren't so fortunate. You see, there was also the Indus Valley Civilization, also known as the Harappan Civilization. This was roughly around 3300 to 1600 BC in ancient Rome. I'm sorry, uh, sorry ancient uh, India. And what do we know about this Harappan civilization? Well, it was discovered around 1842, and it was extensively uh, looked into between 1920 and 1949, but it was much more was flooded in 2010. We have a lot of architecture from it, some very fancy and advanced architecture too. And we have some writings from the Harappan civilization, but guess what? We don't know what it says. They have yet to crack the code of the Harappan civilization. So that part of ancient India's history we know absolutely nothing about. But I am going to tell you about another situation that we know plenty about and how we got to know plenty about that civilization. Hang on to this. Now, ancient China. China had emperors and dynasties from about 221 BC until 1912, when Sun Yat-sen and his followers overthrew the emperors. And so, rivaling the, since the, rivaling the rule of England, China had been ruled by a monarchy for almost 1,500 years. The Chinese are so skilled at their history that I'm sure many of you have heard of the great Confucius, who we're going to talk about a little bit uh, later on in the semester. Guess what? Those Chinese are so skilled at recording their history that we know the living descendants of Confucius over 2,000 years later. On Dr. Henry Louis Gates' uh, television show, uh, Finding Your Roots, he can trace the ancestry of Chinese people to over a thousand years because they were that skilled at record keeping. Well, how did this start? Well, we do know that in ancient, ancient China, they had what were known as the oracle bones, which they would use as soothsayers to predict the future of various events and such. But the real history of China, and by history I mean the real written history of China, begins with a father and son team, Sima Tan and his son Sima Kiyan. And uh, you're going to enjoy this. Some of this is discussed on page 103 in your book, and the rest of it is going to be in a link that I'm going to send you. You see, Sima, Tia, Sima Tan, the father, you see in China, many, especially in ancient China, many of them the clan names are usually the first names, unlike in our civilization, the last names, okay? Around the 100th B, around uh, about a couple hundred years BC, Sima Tan was the grand astrologer for one of the kings. He was a soothsayer. And one of the things that he decided to do was to compile a written history of China, okay? And However, this uh, Simatan was, uh, this is Simatan, incidentally, he was about, he realized that he was about to pass. And so, therefore, as a result, Simatan promised to, made his son promise that he would uh, continue this work. Why? In ancient China, you had what was known as filial piety. This meant that if your parents told you something, that's it. You were honor bound to go by the wishes of their parents. Let's say that your parents died, right? In ancient China, you had to go for three years to mourn them, avoiding all pleasurable things. And that was to make up for the three years that you as an infant were helpless before, you can, before your parents took care of you and you could do for yourself, all right? And let me show you how deep that went. Okay, so Sima Tan, as he was dying, he made his son sit down and promise on his deathbed that he would write what would become known 
as the Shiji. In other words, the records of the grand historian. And this was going to be a history of the clans and kings and overall history of the Chinese people up to that time, which was the Han Dynasty. Well, Sima Khan was serious about this. You see, up until that point, most history, as we know it, was written to pray as propaganda, to praise a certain king or praise a certain dynasty, etc., etc., and so forth, or praise the people of the country and such. But Sima Khan, Sima Khan decided to do it a little bit differently. He was going to use real research. He was going to gather records. He was going to interview people who were present, who were present at various events. And when the events conflicted with each other, he threw them out. But if they agreed with each other, he would keep it in. You see, this is what is, this is, what is known as historiography, the serious study of compiling history. And Sima Kian was the first person that we know of in world history who did this in such a serious manner. So some people say that the Greek... Uh, Herodotus may have been the father of history. Well, there's a good case that uh, you also should include Sima Kiyan. Well, let me tell you how serious this Sima Kiyan was about his work, okay? Sima Kiyan had this to say uh, in his uh, records of the grand historian. I myself have traveled as far, far west as far as Kung Tong, north past Cholu, east to the sea, and in the south. I have sailed to the Yellow and Hawaii rivers. The elders, and e the elders and men of these various lands frequently pointed out to me the plains where the Yellow Emperor Yao and Shun lived. And the places where the, in these places the manners and customs seem quite different. In general, those are the accounts that did not differ from each other, he kept on. Okay? And he also added, I have set down and written only what is certain, and when doubtful cases, I have left a blank. He was honest, because he wanted to get to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if that's not enough reason to, to uh, be inspired by him, get this, folks. There came a time around, uh, he was under service of the Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty, who we're going to talk about in great detail later in the course. And in 99 BC, General Li Ling was fighting the barbarians up north, the same people who would later defeat Rome. And General Li Ling was forced to surrender. However, the Emperor Wu was furious because to him, a general did one of two things in battle. He either won or died trying. So uh, the future did not look bright for Li Ling. However, Sima Khan, his head astrologer and grand historian, did something that was extremely brave for that time. He told the Emperor Wu, spare the life of Li Ling, because after all, he would be more service to you alive than dead. And Emperor Wu said, how dare you go against my rule, Sima Khan. And he gave him three choices of punishment. Either commit suicide, an honest suicide, which was very common in Asia in those days, death before dishonor, so to speak. Or he could pay a huge fine. Well, Sima Khan could not afford the huge fine. And he also felt that uh, if he uh, applied, went along with that, he, that would imply he was really guilty about something. He was not about to commit suicide because he pledged on his father's deathbed that he would finish his father's great historical work. So he was given what? There was one other choice. And I don't mean his head either. Castration. Which would have meant that Sima Kian would have no heirs, uh, that is, no children. And uh, that would be the end of his family's bloodline. But that would allow him to keep his mind off women and children and family and fulfill his honor 
by completing his father's work, the records of the grand historian, he chose castration. And because of that, we have this huge, great book of Chinese history that he used to fulfill his promise to his father as a man of honor. And incidentally, there are English translations of this records of the grand historian. The uh, first English translation was written by uh, Burton Watson in 1961, and there have been several of them ever since, which also, as well as Chinese history, includes Sima Qian's autobiography, where he talks about all this stuff. But this goes to show you the lengths of how a man would go to keep the honor of the promise he made on his father's deathbed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our lecture for the day. Look for uh, links to the things that we talked about. Check the notes for your final paper and for your test coming up on May the 26th. This is Professor Damon L. Ford.